Entry, the catch, Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position, 120 degrees, 29 minutes east, 14 degrees north. Wind light, sky overcast. Remarks, departed port of Manila, 9 a.m. after canceling shore leave for crew. Reason for unscheduled departure, the barefoot nymph in the Mother Hubbard jacket. days out of Swatow, China, that we raised the island of Luzon on the eastern horizon and stood in toward Manila. I swung the Scarlet Queen a little north of her course, and we passed close under the rocks of Corregidor. Every eye on our decks was turned toward the squat fortifications for a minute. By this time, they were covered with jungle growth again and were loudly silent in the manner of monuments that hold the stories of men who made them monuments. Beyond the island, we could see the steaming mass of Bataan, and we swung back into Manila Bay. Manila should have been a friendly, relaxing port for all of us. It meant a break in our voyage under charter to Kangen Sun. To Mike Crewman, it meant the longest shore leave they'd had since we left San Francisco, and girls who knew what that meant to American seamen. To my chief mate, Gallagher, it was like a home state picnic. The harbor was jammed with freighters and tankers from the state. That meant that the Belanga Street bars were jammed with their crews. And that meant that Gallagher was jammed in with them, running into old friends and making new ones. Manila should have been a holiday. And it was for three days and two nights. At 10 o'clock the third night, I was in the cabin alone, thumbing through the latest hydrographic bulletin I've been able to find in town when I heard somebody running down the dock toward the Queen. Red! <laughs> What's the matter? Her husband show up? What's up, Red? Never mind. Come on, calm down. What's the automatic Lay for? Off, will you skip Come it? on, give it to me, Red. Get away from me, stupid. You're off, you're not. What happened? Who'd you kill, the president? I might if he gets in the way. Gallagher! <laughs> With a wild-eyed mate and an automatic loose in Manila, there wasn't much time for the hydrographic bulletin. I closed it, locked my desk, and went out after him. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tolman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log. And every week, a league further in the strange voyage of the Scarlet Queen. When Gallagher is being pushed by temper or is in a hurry, he walks as though he's working up against the incline of a pitching deck in a storm. His body bends forward from a point almost as low as his feet. His shoulders pull up protectively on each side of his head, and his arms barely swing in short arcs. I followed him up to Butanis Street, across the railroad tracks, through the park on Ambil and Dewey Boulevard, and to the left on Belanga. We passed three bars, and I could hear the fourth from a half a block away. The dimly lighted sign that hung outside said, Victory Cabaret. But judging from the din of battle that poured out at us as we approached, somebody had been a little premature in naming it. The remaining activity was going on in the center of what was left of a large bar room. I lost Red for a minute, but then I found him in the center of the room. Hey, Red! What? What? I lost him again, then I saw him heading toward a door at the rear of the room. Red! Red, wait for me! Hey, look! Watch it, will you? Here, get it! Watch it! 
He'd stopped at another door halfway down a long, dimly lit hall by the time I caught up with him. He opened it. The room was furnished with a broken window, a woman who looked like Miss America, and a man who should have been in a morgue instead of sprawled on his face where he was. Shut up. You you frightened me. I didn't know who you were. What happened to him? I I don't know who did it. Somebody came in right after you left, and I tried to hide. Then the window broke, and I heard the shot. That's all it was. Who is he, Red? Cliff Peterson. He sailed on me as Bolson last year. Huh? What's the beef? It started over Lona here, but it wasn't her fault. She was here with Peterson, and this drunk started pawing her, and Peterson poked him. That's where it started. Who was that guy, Lona? You know him? I, I, I met him, yes. His name's Mason Ralph or something like that. But I don't know him. I, I don't know why he picked on me. I don't know why he picked... I, I'm not sure. Sure, he's the one that killed Peterson, but who else could it have been? He was wearing a gun. He started to pull it after Pete slugged him. How'd you get mixed up in this, Red? Of course he pulled that gun. That's when I slugged him. And that's when he took a shot at me, and that's when I got sore. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now you've collected a shiner and a split lip. You've had a fine night. Now it's time for bed. Come on, let's go. Red, please, uh, you you promised me you'd help me out of this. What? I'm, I'm afraid to leave here alone. I don't know where that mason is or anything. The whole thing's so crazy, I'm just scared oh, to death. Look, Skipper, take her home, will you? Why me? I didn't ask you to tag along, did I? But now that you're here, do something. I want to stick with Pete. So I can get word to his ship. I hope somebody's around to do the same thing for me sometime. At this rate, it won't be long. <laughs> Thanks, Skipper. Well, you want to fight your way out through the bar, or would a nice broken back window in a quiet alley do? It was easier getting out than it had been coming in. I slipped out first. I crunched onto the glass, the window glass on the ground. I waited quietly for a minute to see if the noise had raised anybody. I gave the alley a quick once-over. There was nobody in sight. But just as I started to turn back to the building, I caught a glitter of metal in the light from the window. It was a small nickel-plated revolver lying on the other side of the alley. Now, if the gunman had tossed it there, it was all right with me. I left it for the cops. Lona followed me out, and in five minutes, we were in one of Manila's prized two-wheeled horse-drawn rigs, and we were headed for her address. I wonder what's going to happen. The law is going to show up, and they're going to start scattering the bones. That's what usually happens with murder. I'm so scared, I don't know what to do. Oh, come on. Calm down. You're a beautiful dame, and a couple of guys started fighting over you. In fact, the whole joint finally was. You're just living in the wrong century, that's all. Women thrived on that kind of stuff a few hundred years ago. I suppose the police will get my name, won't they? You'll be lucky if they don't. Oh, dear. That'll mean my job. It all started out to be an evening of just fun. Look, Lona, I don't feel quite as sorry for you as you do. I'll tell you why. Maybe it'll help you. It started out to be an evening of just fun for Peterson, too, didn't it? I'm sorry, Skip. All right. Now, is there something else you'd like to talk about? No, I guess you said everything. of the trip was not comfortable, but it was silent. We clapped across the Pesig River and turned down a wide thoroughfare that led in the general direction of the exclusive residential district under Tegate Bridge. The direction surprised me only a little, but her address when we finally reached it was as far removed as Manhattan's Beekman Place from the Victory Cabaret, in class, if not in miles. It was a graceful mansion set behind a well-tended lawn that was made precisely irregular by a few neat garden plots made primly informal by a number of mango and papaya trees that threw cautious shadows in the faint moonlight. Well, uh, aren't you going to let me out? Yeah, if you're sure this is the right address. Do you want to come in? No, thanks. I'm confused enough out here. You're a refreshing guy, Skipper. Uh-huh. The helpless dame and there are no passes or anything. Nothing but a brotherly remark about my being beautiful. Yeah. I'm always shy with women I take away from dead men. Oh. You kicked me all the way up from Belanga Street. I guess you just had to kick me into the house, didn't you? 
Good night, Skipper. Thanks. Good night, Lona. Hey, Cochero. Back to the Victory Cabaret, Belanga Street. I paid my Cochero off and headed into the Victory Cabaret. The only person in sight was a hefty, barrel-waisted bartender who was pushing a broom at the litter on the floor. Keep your pay in your pocket, mate. I ain't open for business. Yeah, so I see. What happened? What happened? Well, I'll tell you. It was no more than a friendly little scuffle. Yeah, looks it. A few of the hands from a few of the ships come to shore for a good time. The, uh, the cops get here? And it cost me a few thousand dollars. And somebody's got to keep up the morale in the merchant marine. A nice bunch of boys. The cops. Couldn't they help you? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Anybody killed? Uh, So I hear. One outright and a half a dozen they wasn't quite sure of. Uh, You missing any friends? Yeah, one. Big red-headed guy wearing a jumper with the sleeves rolled up, tattooing on his arms. With a name like Gallagher. He's a friend of yours, you say? Yeah, why? You better be careful who you admit it to. They got him booked for murder. They're nuts. Oh, I don't know. The fellow was shot in one of my rooms back there. When they sneaked up on this Gallagher, he was outside the window with a gun that then the shooting still in his hand. They're nuts. I saw that gun lying out there in the alley myself. I can prove Gallagher didn't kill him. Huh. Well, that story, you better find another port. And while we're on the subject of moving, get out of here, will you? I lost enough friends in the force tonight. I walked out of the door ten steps up the sidewalk. And then five steps back. I watched the bartender pick up the telephone. This time I took a cab to Lona's address. I wondered what she'd say now about involving her name when it was to clear red. I had a few answers for that. And I was working on a few things to say to Gallagher for standing there in that alley with the murder weapon in his hand when we pulled up in front of the house. By the time I reached the door, I knew it was no good. It was 1 a.m., but I had a hunch that for Lona, the day hadn't ended. Well, well, Skipper. I hope it isn't too late. It never is at my house. Come on in. She had a sort of breathless expression when she talked to me. The corners of her mouth were drawn up slightly into a bare trace of a smile. Her lips were always separated, just a little. Her eyes were warm and brown. In here. She led me through a short hall and down three steps into a large, carelessly furnished room. She was dressed in a hostess gown of some light, clinging material. Oh, I'm sure. Her hair went with her eyes and it hung just short of shoulder length. And her feet were bare. We crossed the room, went oh, into a den. that had a tile floor, low, wide bamboo furniture, wide screened windows that looked out onto a side garden. This is my favorite room. Do you like it? Yeah, it's great. I don't think you really like rooms. Some men don't. Sit down. Uh No, no, not there. Mm -hmm. You'll see my abstractions. I paint a little. Over here on the chair. Have you been drinking, or shall I mix one for you? I haven't been drinking, and I'd like one. All right. How'd you know I'd be back? Because I asked you. I didn't hear you. I didn't ask you with words. I asked you with me. Oh. You're an amazing little creature. Why are you looking at me like that? Huh? You've changed so many times tonight that I can't stay abreast of it. I change all the time so I won't become monotonous. That's the only way I can stand myself. Which one of me do you like the best? This one. Barefooted. With your hair down. I was brushing my hair when you rang the bell. I don't think many women do, but I love my hair. So soft. Feel it. Where do you come from? Every place. Do that with my hair some more. What's your other name besides Skipper, I mean? Phil. Oh. What? What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing, darling. The glass just rolled off and broke. For a minute, I didn't know what it was. Listen. That. That sound will be this night, even when I'm old. Your nice tanned face and your blue eyes and your strong hands. You think I'm beautiful, don't you? I think you're beautiful good to be with someone who thinks you're beautiful. Tell me. You're beautiful. Yes, I know. Darling, 
Phil, I'm so happy. It's so good to be beautiful with you. Maybe it would have been different if I hadn't been afraid of her. Or if I hadn't been convinced that everything she said or did had purpose. Or if I hadn't known that each of us was waiting for the other to bring up the subject of Gallagher's arrest. But there was no doubt about one thing. And it was hard to keep it from overshadowing anything else. As she repeatedly stated, as she loved to state, as she loved to hear me repeatedly state, she was beautiful. From any measurement or any comparison, she was beautiful. But even she dropped the subject after a while. Make mine weaker than yours, will you, Phil? Let's put it the other way. I'll make mine stronger than yours. It makes you happier that way. I'm willing. Mm. Oh. Better get this glass off the deck unless you expect me to carry you around the rest of the night. How long are you going to be in Manila, Skipper? Oh, I don't know. I wish it was going to be for a long time. Yeah, it might be. Phil, listen to me. I've got to say this. You've got to know I mean it. Mm -hmm. It happens, but it never happened to me, and now I think it could. I could fall in love. <laughs> don't laugh at me. <laughs> don't joke. I'm not joking. For the first time in my life, I think it could happen. I'm sure you mean that as a great compliment. But somehow it doesn't hit me. Oh, Phil, why are you acting like this? Because I don't believe you. Because I've never had any reason to believe you. Because I've gotten nothing but lies from you ever since I met you. But I'm not lying. Why are you treating me like this? What other way is there? You're a great little animal to have around the house, but you're only safe when you're out in front where somebody can watch you. All right, Phil. Maybe you know what you're trying to say. So do you. For one thing, you killed Peterson. I did not. You were lying, man. You said he was shot from outside the window, and he wasn't. He was shot by somebody inside the room. You were the only one there. I didn't kill him. Now, don't think I haven't enjoyed your so alluring hospitality. But the smiling, spontaneous welcome I got at the door doesn't hold water. Because I'll bet you my ship that you knew I was on the prowl and probably heading this way 40 minutes before I got here and you heard it from the bartender at the Victory Cabaret. I saw him go to the phone. What are you supposed to do? Hold me here? And for why? What do you want, Phil? I want my chief mate. I'll trade you or anybody else in on him. Oh, Phil, why did you wait? If you suspected these things, why did you go through with the, the sham of life? All I want is my chief mate. If you don't start doing something about it, I will. All right, Phil. I have to make a couple of calls. The phone's in the other room. You carry me. Hmm? Oh, yeah. It was the deal, was it? Ah. Mm. Uh. I wonder why it had to be this way, Phil. I don't know. I don't know what your game is, and I don't care, but you were in it before I was. Phil, Red was only a coincidence. Really, he was. Huh? He just happened to know Cliff Peterson and sit down with us. And then the stupid redhead, he had to go out the window and find that gun and be standing there when the police showed up. So then Delkey had the brainstorm and twisted Who's the Delkey, story. Who's Delkey, the bartender? Yes, he told the cops that Gallagher instead of Mason had made the pass at me. That started the whole thing. And he went after Peter. Yeah, yeah. All right, here's your phone. Do you believe me, Phil? How in the devil should I know when to believe you and when not to? I told you, I don't care. All I want is my chief mate. When I get him, I'll believe anything. Gallagher was just supposed to stall things until Mason could get back to the States. He was leaving in the morning. I was supposed to hold you until his ship... All got right, out. fine. Let him find somebody else for a stall. Where are you going to start with, the chief of police? <laughs> Afraid the police think even less of me than you do. We have to settle this between Ralph Mason and Delkey and myself. You're going to bring them out here? Where else? Hmm. Looks like I'm going to be outnumbered, doesn't it? I stood by her when she made her calls, and as far as I could figure, they were straight. Just strong invitations to get to the house as quickly as possible. Then she made a typical exit into another part of the house, and I went back to the den. I thought the least I could do was to get rid of the jagged edges of our brief and hypocritical romance, so I got a bar towel and pushed the broken glass under the couch. When she came in, she'd gone through another complete change. She was dressed like her front lawn, primly. 
informal in beige slacks topped by an over-modest jacket buttoned high around her throat and hanging loosely like a Mother Hubbard to her waist. It shouldn't be long, Phil. Maybe we could have a neat one while we wait. Yeah, sure, sit down. Incidentally, I don't like your new character. It's all right for the time of night, isn't it? I guess so. I think I ought to warn you, Phil. Mason is dangerous. He'll try to buy you off first. Buy me off for what? I'll try to talk you into set... Do you want to go to the door with me? Or do you trust me enough to let me meet them? I can't think of anybody I ever trusted less. Go ahead. Connie, this is Ralph Mason, and I believe you said that you'd met Mr. Delk. Yeah. yeah. What's on your mind, Connie? My chief mate. I want him out of jail. I got enough on that mess in the Victory Cabaret to tell a pretty good story. It's a pretty good story the way it stands. Cops like it. They won't by the time I get through with it. Just one thing. The glass from that window that was supposed to have been broken from the outside. None of it's inside the room where it should be. You think that's enough? Since they arrested Gallagher standing on the outside looking in, it might be. Even Manila cops should change their mind on that one. That uh, story could wait, couldn't it? Not the way I see it, no. Use your head, mate. Don't be rude. What's your price, Connie, to leave your mate in the jug until we're clear of this? With the truth, you can get him out any time. It's pretty high. I'm leaving tomorrow. I'll start with $15,000. I don't think you can go high enough, Mason. You might as well quit. All I need is a patsy, and I don't care who it is. May I say something, Ralph? I don't quite see why we have to bargain with Captain Connie. You didn't hesitate about Peterson after his double-cross, Ralph. Now Captain Connie is in the way. When you hate, you hate real good, don't you? It's business, Captain. I use such bad judgment when I offer to let you join our little organization. You what? What are you talking about? Captain Connie has a ship that would fit into our inter-island work. I'm so afraid I made a mistake. I explained the type of contraband that was coming in from the States, the prices we were getting for it, and how there were opportunities for a man like him. I'm so sorry. He led me to believe that he was interested. You're a sucker for men, Lona. You found Peterson, too. That cost us $30,000 worth of stateside liquor in three months to get it over here. Peterson sold it on his own. Not quite on his own, Ralph. He didn't have any contacts here. Who was in with him? Well, I was his very best friend in Manila. Why, you dirty... Mason shoved his chair out of the way behind him as he got up and started reaching inside his coat for a shoulder holster. That's when the Mother Hubbard jacket lifted a little on the right side and Lona's manicured hand pulled a belly gun from the waistband of her slack. It spoke twice, quickly and effectively. And Mason stiffened. And his right hand stopped an inch away from his gun butt. And he toppled slowly backward across his overturned chair. Don't ask one question. I have this all worked out. But, Lona... You can solve the murder in your cabaret. You take Mason down to the police. Tell them the story of how the glass is on the wrong side of the window. You tell them you captured Mason single-handed and you'll gain a whole lot of new customers. Well, they believe me, Lona. It's the truth, isn't it? And here's the gun you captured him with to prove it. Now get him out of here. Good heavens. Look at that floor. I wonder what this all meant, Phil. Hmm? Oh, what, Lana? This thing we lived through. It's been important, hasn't it? Yeah, slightly. Two guys didn't make it. Oh, that isn't what I mean. We did move everything and make this little room the center of the world, didn't we? I wish I knew what you meant. You wonder if I'm still in love with you, don't you? Handedly, by this time, I don't know what I wonder. I could be, Phil. I'm afraid it's impractical. If you just hold me, just once more. Tell me once more. You're beautiful, Lola. And I'll always remember the glasses, Phil. It's getting late. You'll have to go. Well, well, couldn't we have one more drink? Oh, no, I wouldn't dare. Got to put my hair in braid and straighten the house up. My husband is coming home Your in the husband? morning. He worries so about me. I have to have everything just Your husband? so. Where is he? Oh, he has gold mines in Mindoro. He's much older than I am. But he's rich. He allows me to stay here in Manila with my hobbies. Goodbye, Captain Carney. By 9.30... 
nine that morning Gallagher had been released, I'd rounded up the rest of my men and we slipped away from our berth and headed out through Manila Bay. We picked up a moist, hot wind at the mouth. Stand by to make sail! And the exhausted crew stumbled to their stations, every man bare to the waist and glistening wet. With four feet, make sail! Even the mantle looked tired as it struggled up the mainmast and reached hopefully out for a pulling breeze. And the jet chief, men! Start me now! They didn't move smartly, but the jibs crawled out. Then the mizzen boom swung sullenly over my head. And the queen rolled slowly down toward Verde Island Passage, the Sabuyan Sea beyond. Well, I had a good rest last night, but it looks like I'm the only one aboard the did. Oh, lay off, Ray. Look at that crew. It's a disgrace. I'm half a mind to turn them all to holy stone in the deck from bow to stern. Uh-huh. Take over, will you, Red? Oh, not on your life. This is your watch, and I'm going to take my exercise. That Manila jail air is invigorating. Oh, lay off, will you, Red? Don't forget, I was sitting in the cabin with a hydrographic bulletin when you busted in. <laughs> take it easy, Skipper. Go on below. I'll take your trip. Ah, the devil you will. But just wait till you crawl aboard the next time. And don't think you haven't done it before. I'll hand you some sympathy. <laughs> what are my chances in the next port? There, and I'll be waiting for you. It's Maspate. Maspate. Mm-hmm. What do you know about that jail? Nothing. And uh, before I take a nap, huh? what is your outstanding recollection of the capital of the Philippines? Some broken glass I pushed under a bamboo couch. <laughs> and I wonder what her husband's going to say. Uh, it's funny you mention that, Skipper. Yeah? I met a husband in jail. He was in for murder. Who did he kill, the wife? No, the smooth-talking stranger. <laughs> Drink, Skipper? He killed the wrong one. After you, mate, after you. Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, 5.30 p.m. Miles traveled from San Francisco, 9,450. Wind light, sky overcast, sea leaden, carrying full sail. Ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney, Master. Scarlet Queen has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.